Many like to say that the world is an unforgiving place. I like to say that everyone wants a second chance, but no one wants to forgive. Forgiveness is a luxury that we are allowed over and over and over. But sometimes some of us aren't allowed that luxury. But does that mean that the mistakes that we made should stick with us even in death? But does that mean that the mistakes that we made should stick with us even in death? March 21st, 2001, the world would make way for Diamond Bradley. Diamond would be born in the town of Clarksville, Tennessee. It would be here that she would take her first breath, her first steps. And after her family spends roughly a year in the town of Clarksville, Tennessee, they would relocate to Spring Valley, Illinois in the year of 2002. Diamond was born into a big family. She would be in a family of three sisters and four brothers. With a big family like that, the family was close. Friends and family described Diamond as being a live wire. She was the life of the party. She had a contagious laugh. She was the girl who came in the room and everything lit up. She liked to sing, dance, and Diamond had goals in life. She was driven. Even with a strong family support system, Diamond seemed to think that she didn't have anyone in this world. She would often take to social media to bear her soul, letting everyone in the world know exactly how she felt when she felt it. If you observe Diamond from her social media, you would quickly see that she was all smiles. She would often post to friends and family random posts, whether it be for laughs or maybe to, you know, pull at someone's leg. But I quickly began to realize that deep inside of her posts was a completely different person. Whenever Diamond was on live, she would often say negative things about herself. She would often call herself unattractive, ugly, and you know, the more I started to look at these posts, I began to realize that I don't really think she meant it. I really think that she was just searching for someone, anyone, to tell her otherwise, to say, you know, you're not ugly, you're beautiful, you're attractive. But these posts continued on and on. It was a reoccurring thing, so I'm guessing she didn't get what she wanted. I'm ugly, you guys. Like, I'm ugly. That's f and nobody's responding to me. <laughs> The year is 2018 and Diamond is 16 years old. January 24th, Doris Bradley, the mother of Diamond, would knock on her door, but after a brief moment of silence, she realizes that Diamond isn't in her room. She goes in and she's right. Diamond's missing now. In the beginning, her mother isn't too frantic. She searches for her daughter, calls around, you know, goes to the usual spots, but after hours of her 16-year-old daughter being missing, now she's losing it. And she decides to report her missing to the police. Now the town is on alert and everyone is searching for missing Diamond Bradley. So now the police are alerted that Diamond Bradley is missing. So they conduct the usual things. They go to questioning friends and family, knocking on doors. They even decided to go to the home so they could search around the room just to see if anything was out of the ordinary. Now, when they get to the home, that's when one of the sisters decides that it's time to speak up. She would alert the police that Diamond was in possession of two cell phones. One cell phone that she had on her when she went missing, but the other cell phone was still at the house. So the police take possession of this cell phone and what they find inside of the cell phone is nothing short of shocking. Now when the police take possession of this phone, the phone is locked. They can't immediately get into it, but they work their magic and they're able to get into the cell phone. Now when they get into this cell phone, they realized that Diamond was kind of living a double life. They realized that Diamond was texting back and forth with several different men and that Diamond was posting on escort websites. So 
With Diamond only being 16 years old, that just opened up a whole realm of possibilities as to what could have happened to her. And it makes it that much harder for the police to find her. So with very little information to go on, the police decide to track her phone. They're able to track her movements through her cell phone, and then they begin obtaining surveillance footage from the cameras along that route. The first surveillance camera footage that they would pull would actually belong to the gas station that was across the street. Now, this was a gas station that Diamond frequently visited, whether she was getting coffee or snacks. It was a place that she was often seen at. Now, when the police pulled the footage around the time that she left her house they don't see diamond anywhere in this footage they only see a truck pull in a guy come in the gas station he purchases something and then this guy leaves out now after this camera footage is captured no one is captured on surveillance camera coming in that store again for a good amount of time so at this point that camera footage is useless after being unable to locate Diamond inside of the footage at the gas station, they decided to pull more footage from other cameras around that area, specifically the cameras where her phone pinged at in the area. So they begin pulling cameras, but they got one good shot of an intersection. Now this intersection would be the streets of St. Peter's and Spalding Street. And when they take a look at this footage, they still don't see Diamond. They can only see a series of cars going to and from the area. So all the police have is this major intersection, this captured surveillance footage, and if they don't find any tips about her whereabouts, there's a very slim chance that they'll ever find her at all, because after this major intersection is the interstate, and then it's nothing but open road for a hundred miles. And a hundred miles is a very big area to be searching for someone so they need to find something now and quick after brainstorming the detectives would decide to pull the footage from the days leading up to her disappearance so they would pull about a week's worth of footage at this major intersection they would study every car that passed along that route every morning. After analyzing the footage, they realized that the same cars pass along that route every morning. So when they go back and review the footage from the day that Diamond went missing, they realized that 11 out of the 13 cars that pass along that intersection every morning are regulars, and the other two might hold the key to Diamond's disappearance. So after analyzing the other three cars that were abnormal to that area, they would home in on a black Jeep. So they're desperate at this point, but it's about to get a lot worse because they're now about to realize that this black Jeep may not only be involved in her disappearance, but it might also be involved in her murder because on January 27th of 2018, the body of Diamond would be discovered in a ditch in a rural area. She would be discovered just off of Highway 850 North in Putnam County, Illinois. At the end of the autopsy, the pathologist would conclude that she was stabbed multiple times and then dumped in that area. Now, that's a very sad outcome, but what's even sadder is that at this point the police still only have one lead and that's a black jeep so the police search frantically for days for this black jeep the date is february 5th of 2018 to be exact this would be the day that the police force would decide to basically put boots on the ground they would go around asking the residents about the black jeep knocking on doors etc and then while they're out canvassing the area, they would actually notice a black Jeep sitting in the driveway of a home. When it comes to the black Jeep, it wasn't hard for the police to narrow it down to a certain make and model. And once they got the make and model of the vehicle, they struck gold because it turns out that in the area of Spring Valley, Illinois, there were only two people who were actually driving a Jeep of that make and model, and one of them has already been ruled out. So the police go and knock on this door, and basically at this point, all of their hope is in this last situation because if this doesn't pan out, they don't know where to look next. So they knock on the door and a guy comes to the door and introduces himself as a guy who goes by the name of Richard Henderson. Richard Henderson seems cooperative. 
polite, very cordial towards the officers. So they tell him, how about we come down to the station and we have a little chat, you know, just to rule you out because you are driving the same vehicle that we're searching for. So he agrees to come down to the station for this interview. Once the police get Richard down to the station, another police officer at the precinct notices him while he's sitting in the interrogation room. But this cop doesn't notice him from say a traffic ticket or a minor infraction. This cop actually recognizes him as the guy who was on the surveillance footage at the gas station across the street from Diamond's home. Armed with this new information, the detectives would enter the interrogation room, but they decided to take it easy at first. They figured they'll just ask him about his movements on that morning and see what he has to say. So the questioning begins. They asked Richard a series of questions about his activity on that morning. However, he would give the same story over and over. He went out, he went back home, and he doesn't understand why he is being questioned in the first place. So the police decide to break out their ace in the hole, and they question him about their surveillance footage. They basically tell him, you know, the jig is up. We have you on surveillance footage at this gas station on the morning of January 24th of 2018. What were you doing there? Richard answers that he went to the gas station to purchase an item and then he went back home. So they allow Richard to finish this lie, but at the end of the lie, that's when they hit him with the truth. They let him know that not only do we have you captured on surveillance camera at the gas station, but we were also able to track your vehicle passing through several major intersections and then ultimately going out of town. But Richard wasn't just headed out of town. He was headed out of town in the same direction in which Diamond Bradley's phone was pinging from. So here we have a guy who was just so happened to be seen at the gas station around the same time that Diamond went missing. And now he's headed out of town in the same direction that her phone was pinging from. So it's not looking too good for him. After a couple of more hours pass in this interrogation, the police decide to hit the roads. They ask this guy, well, how about you take us on the road and you show us the exact route that you took that morning, you know, just to clear yourself. So at first, he doesn't want to do it. But after a little convincing, he decides to hop in the squad car and show them the area that he drove that morning. So while they're driving down the road and he's showing them, each turn he made, what exits he took, they come across the area that Diamond was discovered in. Now, when they get to this area, Richard begins to clam up. He becomes a totally different person. So the police begin to question him. What happened? What happened on the morning of January 24th of 2018 inside of your black Jeep? He lets it all out. He says that on that morning, he was storming the internet. He came across Diamond's ad. He then solicited her. So then he goes to her area to pick her up. He then says that they drove to a secluded area. They had intercourse, and then he told Diamond to get out of his car. He said that when he told Diamond to get out of his car, she then pulled a knife from her purse. After this, he details that a struggle occurred, and then he ultimately had to take her life in self-defense. Once Richard Henderson was fully prosecuted for this act, he would decide not to take it to court and who would rather do a plea deal. 